time before the semester ends on us, okay? So, a couple of things I want you guys to get straight about intervals and about some of the chord symbols that we will be using, okay? So that's what today is gonna be, all right? So, first off, I saw in a lot of the, the homework that were returned, if you saw something like this, or if I saw something like this and you were analyzing it, I saw a lot of people analyzing this as a diminished second. Remember that diminished seconds are very rare. Okay, diminished seconds are going to essentially be unisons that you just can't call a unison because it's two different notes. Okay? But a half step, this is B flat to A, that's a half step away, right? That's a minor second. Okay, this wasn't, not everybody had this issue, but a couple of you did fairly consistently. So you've got to make sure that you're not, you're not overstating the closeness of this interval, right? A diminished second, <coughs> just for ultimate clarity, I'm going to put a line through that one, that's wrong. This would be a diminished second. Now, B double flat is going to look like A on the piano. It's going to sound like A on any instrument you play, right? And then A is literally A. Okay, so this is a diminished second. Functionally, it's a unison. You seeing this is going to be fairly rare. Okay, it's not that it absolutely never happens, but it's pretty rare. Okay, so I want you guys to be aware of that. Generally, what you're going to see, half step, minor seconds. Full step, major seconds. That's how we deal with seconds. Okay, now, <clears throat> a couple of you, not that many of you, but a few of you had this. And this is a very peculiar circumstance. That's a half step, but it's not a minor second because it's some version of C to some version of C. So I have to analyze it if I'm going to be very specific, right? I have to analyze it as a form of a unison. I can't analyze it as a second. Does that make sense? Most of us <coughs> would just say it's a half step, right? If you're working in an ensemble, it's, hey, that's a half step, you know, make your, make your interval really small, tighten that up, you're going too far. That's usually the critique that you would have, right? People are overshooting their half steps, okay? But if you were going to actually functionally analyze this, this would be an augmented unison, okay? Because you saw that one first and you saw that one second. Does that make sense? If you saw it the other way, it would be a diminished unison. I know, it's dumb, right? That's why we say half steps more often than not. Okay, because it really just depends on which one you saw first, which one, whether it's augmented or diminished, because we're just kind of pushing the cups around, okay? All right, so think about that. Um, think about that as you work through these, okay? That was one thing I saw consistently enough that I want to make sure that I address that. Any questions regarding the second? Because of the notes, okay. So, <coughs> We come over here, I'm jumping to the bass plus now, okay, and I'm doing this by design, because every now and then I see some of you that are more comfortable in one clef or another, you automatically put that clef in your head and you start reading the wrong interval. Does that make sense? So if you're used to treble and you look at bass, you see this and you think, oh, that's a C, and then that's a D, so this is a major second. The problem with that is you're not in treble clef, sorry, whoever reads in treble clef, right? You're in bass clef. So this is an E and this is an F, which means that this is a minor second, because it's a half step. Does that make sense? So always be aware of that as you work through any, any example that you're given, any test that you're given, anything like that. You've got to keep your brain open for, is this treble or bass, because it's never a guarantee, right? Especially as you move out of playing your own rep, right? A lot of us, um, well, yeah, it's kind of true. Like, I started out playing piano. The benefit of piano is you read two clefs pretty much all the time, right? But I didn't really play any instrument other than piano, with the exception of recorder, until I got into college, right? And so what's happening with you is if you've lived on your instruments for the past five, six, seven years, right? Now you're coming in this area where you may have to go look at somebody else's instruments and think about what they're having to do, right? And that may be a new sensation. Just make sure you're always thinking about this piece of information before you start assigning values. Does that make sense? I still have to do that when I grade you guys' work because, for instance, I mean, you have it in different, you know, pieces, different keys, different clefs, right? And I have to remember, okay, this piece was in D, this next piece is in A, so 
that changes the intervals, right? Because G sharps show up, that changes what things are. And I have to keep my brain fresh looking at you know new information from you. Okay. All right. <clears throat> now, this is the big thing. I didn't see many people go here, but I saw enough that I want to address it. Remember that seconds, thirds, sixths, and sevens, these will never be perfect intervals. You cannot call them a perfect anything. Okay, you've got to remember that. So these can be major, minor, and then additionally they can be augmented or diminished. Either of those is acceptable. Okay, well not acceptable, but possible, right? And then the other side of it is that uh, unisons, fourths, fifths, and octaves These can never be major or minor. They are generally going to be perfect or then augmented and diminished. Okay, so you will never go through a process where you see a minor fifth or a minor fourth major. None of that's ever going to happen. Okay? So just realize that as you work. If you start analyzing, you start thinking minor fifth or minor fourth, get that out of your head. Because there's never a circumstance where that's something that is something to study. Okay? Um, but in general, I haven't seen I haven't seen a ton of you trip up on that. It's just if you do anything other than that, it will be incorrect every time. And so I don't want you falling down that route. Okay. Um, but in, in general, these are the main things. Now, here's one other thing you have to keep in mind when you're working with intervals, sharps and flats. Remember, they don't mean major minor. Sharps and flats don't mean squat. Sharps and flats only adjust the ratio of one note to another, right? So depending on what gets changed and what position it is to another one, I'm going to get possibly major, minor, augmented, and diminished perfect. It has nothing to do with the flat making something smaller or the sharp making something bigger. That does because they don't work like that, right? So keep that in mind. Most of y'all have been doing a good job of keeping those clear. Okay. All right. <coughs> now, any questions on this? So, um, the next thing that I want to talk about, and this is something that, as I talk about this, if a question comes to mind, please ask, okay, because I want to, I don't want your brain to go down a certain track, and then you end up in, in a completely different world than the rest of it. Yeah, Paul. When we hear you say that something is extremely rare, yes. is, is it safe to assume that's probably not going to be on the test? We don't have to worry about um, it. Yeah, well, so something like an augmented unison, I'm not going to put that on the test because I think it's dumb, right? Um, in general, I'm not telling you that to tell you not to look for it on the test. I'm telling you that not to look for it in everyday life. Does that make sense? Okay. So, like, if you find yourself analyzing a ton of diminished seconds, chances are you misunderstood something. Does that make sense? If you look at a piece of media and you're like, wow, a lot of diminished seconds in this piece, chances are you probably need to rethink what you're saying about it. Okay? Um, so that's, it's really more about what will you encounter than what am I going to test you on. Okay? Now, uh, that being said, I'm not going to test you on the most atypical things I can think of. Right, I'm gonna mostly live in the in the usual stuff, and every now and then I'll ask you weird questions. Okay, cool. Um, all right. So this is the part that I want you guys to. If you have a question in the middle of it, make sure you get in there and ask it. Okay, because this is one of the weird parts. All right. So. These are both the same letter, right? This is G, this is C, this is G, this is C, right? I know we all know this, right? But the challenge that comes into play is what we have mostly been doing in this class at this point is looking at the bottom note and going to the top note, right? Looking at the bottom note, going to the top note, looking at the bottom note, going to the top note. What you see first often is whatever is to the left, right? So if I look at this and I say, okay, bottom note, top note, cool, right? I know how to analyze this. 
If I look at this one, is this the bottom note? No, but I saw it first. To which you reply, I don't care, right? This is the bottom note. So right, everybody following me? I know this seems like really, really easy, and it is, right? But I want us to get in the same space together, okay? The reason this matters is the same note in different directions creates different numbers, okay? So if I look at G, but I think G up to C, that's one, two, three, four away. So it's some kind of fourth. Everybody with me? But if I think G down to C, well, that's a different direction. It's going to give me a different number, okay? Just because they're the same letters doesn't mean I'm gonna get the same interval, okay? So if I take it and I go the opposite direction, G down to C, one, two, three, four, five, that's some kind of fifth. Do you follow? And you always have to be thinking about that when you work with these intervals, because just because it's the same two notes doesn't mean that you're always gonna get the same relationship intervalically, okay? So if I take a look at this, well, this is a perfect fourth, and this is a perfect fifth, and I can go through, you know, and figure out why if I need to, right? But you have to realize that G to C is not always a fourth or always a fifth. It's gonna depend on how, how far away they are from each other, okay? If it go, comes down to like really, really brass tacks, just count the spaces, one, two, three, four, you're not gonna call that a fifth, right? Like, if you really end up in that, in that space where it's like, this really isn't making sense to me, I really need to just get real basic, you just count lines and spaces, and, and it will tell you the number, right? The number should never be the part that trips you up, okay? Quality may throw you for a loop, that happens sometimes, but if, you, if it comes down to it, you can always just count the spaces, and that'll tell you, okay? So remember that, because I was seeing this every now and then with, uh, let's say, a piece of music that has like, uh, uh, okay, so I've got this key signature here, and I'm looking at a, uh, some kind of motion like this, right? And what I was seeing was it was perfect fourth, and then perfect fourth, and then perfect fourth again because it's always the same letters, right? You're seeing B flat to E flat, E flat to B, but you have to understand they're in different orientations of each other, right? So I'm gonna get a different number. It becomes more obvious if I have, let's say that I had an example like this, C to D, D to C, and back, right? Well, this is a second. Is anybody gonna call that a second? Would any of you look at that and say, I think that's probably a second. No, right, because you know that seconds are neighbors, right? Like they're right there next to each other. So it becomes the trickiest, I feel like, on the fourths and fifths, because they're the closest to being the same. They're not, but they're closer than seconds and sevens or thirds and sixths would be, okay? So just make sure you keep these things straight as you work through. Does that make sense? Overall, I think intervals are going very well. I'm only seeing a few trends that are negative, not just like a crazy shotgun splat of like everything that it could possibly go wrong, which some semesters I see that. So that's a good thing, okay? Um, any questions regarding what we just talked about here? Okay. Now, I need to get into um, triads and talking about them. Um, now, with triads, and this is very important, um, there are two systems, okay? There's the figured base system, and that's the one that we were talking about last class where I was saying, okay, first inversion means a six, second inversion means a six, four. We, we talked a little bit about that, all right? But then there's the other where I just say, hey, play a C chord, right? And that has nothing to do with figured base. It's really like two different worlds, okay? So we're gonna go through, we're gonna talk about each one and what it means and how they, they talk about inversions as well, because that also is different, okay? So I'm gonna start out, there's pop chord, okay? I'm sure there's other terms for this, but that's the one that most of us use around here. And then there's figured base. And what a pop chord analysis is going
going to do is it's not going to tell you anything about the key that you're in. All it's going to do is tell you the chords that you should play. Okay? Now, I'm going to sound like an elitist here, and I know I really am not. I just, it's, this is easier for someone who is musically illiterate to understand immediately what they're supposed to do. Does that make sense? Because if I have guitar, and I know that a C chord feels like this, and somebody says play a C chord, I can go, okay, right? And it doesn't really take anything beyond that for me to be able to play the music, okay? So what you do in this top chord analysis is you just say, okay, my piece has a C chord, and then it has an F chord, and then it has a G chord, and then it has um, maybe a D minor chord, right? Getting fancy, it would not be in that order, it would be in this order, bother me. Okay. So you would play these three chords. Now, this tells you a couple of things, right? This tells you that all of these chords are in root position, okay? So when you deal with a top chord analysis, if it's just a letter and no slash anything, that means that you're in root position. It will also tell you if it's a capital letter, that means it's a major chord, okay? And if it's lowercase with an M, or possibly if you're printing it out, sometimes you'll see uppercase with an M, but it always has to have that lowercase M, okay? That would mean that this chord is minor. We're gonna use lowercase for everything if it's minor, okay? So this is going to tell you the types of chords that you're looking at and the position that they are in. So I would say, okay, well this is a C major chord, and then this is an F major chord, and then this is a D minor chord, Okay, G major chord, so there, there's my four chords for this piece. Now, if I know something about music and I've studied it, I probably know that this piece is more than likely it is in C major. Okay, because those chords, the way they're interacting with each other point towards C. We'll get to that as you work through this. If you're not there, you have to worry about it, okay? But do I need to know that to understand that information? No, I don't need to know that. I just know that it's a C major chord, it's an F major chord, it's a D minor chord, it's a G major chord, that's it. Boom, done. Okay? Now, in figure eight, I'm going to assume that you know something about key signatures. That's the first assumption that I have to make in figure eight for any of this to work. So if I tell you key of C, you have to know what that means. You have to know that that means no sharps, no flats, unless something special happens, okay? So, if I were to say this, now what I can do is I can say, in the key of C, what number would I assign to C? I would assign one to it, right? So I'm gonna write this Roman numeral one, and the fact that I wrote just the numeral and no six or six four means that it's in root position, okay? And then if I'm in the key of C, I go up how many to get to F? C is my number one, right? C, D, E, F. So this is a four chord, because I had to go up four to find it in the key, right? So I go one to four. Now, what do I know about the key of C major? No sharps, no flats, right? So this is going to be F major, because F, A, C is a major third and perfect fifth. So it all is happening Everything, I know my key signature, I know my intervals, I know my chord qualities. All those things that we've studied this semester, all of them go into me knowing this. Does that make sense? It's a bunch of information that now I'm consolidating into one thing, okay? And then this one would be a C major, okay? And then if I'm in the key of C and I look at this and I say, okay, what's D minor? Okay, well, C, D, that's gonna be two, right? D in the key of C is gonna be a minor chord because it has a minor third and a perfect fifth. So I'm gonna write a lowercase two, just like I wrote lowercase D and M here. I'm gonna write a lowercase I, I to say two, okay? And then I'm gonna come over, G is number five, it's major, so I'm gonna write a capital. So I end up with the same result but the process for me getting there was very different. Do you see that? I didn't use the same logical train at all to get there, okay? Everything here is sped through the key, all right? Now, what if I said,
if I go back to my old circumstance and I just play C, G, C, F, D major, G, well, this, this, no problem, right? What if I were to have to do that in this? You see how that becomes, that becomes an issue, right? Because this doesn't, D major doesn't fit in this key. I can't explain that in the key that I'm in. Do you follow me? So this is where this system, it has ways for compensating for that. But it's a little more complex at that point. We're not going to deal with that just yet, OK? But it becomes more complex when you start dealing with chords that don't belong to the key, OK? So where did we start out? When we started talking about triads, we were talking about diatonic triads. What does it mean when I say diatonic? They're in the key, right? So the only things you guys need to worry about with fingered bass right now are chords that are actually in the key. All right, and that's important to remember. I'm not gonna ask you about chords that don't fit in the key when I'm using figured bass. When I'm asking you this, does the key matter at all? No, just the intervals that make up the chord matter. So these do not belong to any kind of key at all. Okay, they're just chords. All right, so if I ask you, hey, what's a C major chord? You know, what, what key am I in? Does it matter? It's a C major chord, it's C, E, and G. It's just a fact. Does that make sense? If I ask you, hey, what's a one chord? Well, that's a stupid question. What key am I in? Does that make sense? You have to have more context to be able to answer, what's a one chord? What's a two chord? Blah, 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 blah. OK? All right, now, we talked a little bit last class, or well, a little bit longer ago than last class, but we dealt with some last class, about inversion. OK? So when I start inverting chords, what I'm doing is I'm changing what the lowest sounding note is. So this would be a chord in inversion because the root of this chord is C, right? But that's not the lowest note. E is the lowest note. Okay, so I have two ways of notating this. Let's say that I'm in, uh, in the key of C again. Let's just do that. And it, this is obviously a one chord. But to explain the position that I find C in, I have to use this number six to the right of the, the numeral. And that's what explains that this is in first inversion. Okay? And then if I were to invert it once again, the fifth is now the lowest sounding note. It's still the same chord, but I find it in a different position again, and I have to explain that position. Okay? So I say it's a one, six, four. And the, the guiding principle that I give you guys is saying, okay, one number, one inversion. Two numbers, two inversions. That's how you think about this. Does that make sense? If it doesn't have anything, we're in root position. If it's just the numeral, pure. Okay? Yes? Uh, those top chords, do we use inversions too? Or? Yeah, that's what we're going to do in just a sec. Yep. So far, so good here? Okay. So. With the pop chords, I can't use six, because if you know anything about pop chords, by writing a six, what I'm telling you is to add six above whatever the root is, and it changes the chord. It makes it a completely different chord, okay? Well, not, not completely different, but it sounds way different, okay? So I can't, I can't cross over figured bass into pop chords. It doesn't work. I have to have a different way of saying inverse this chord. So what I do in pop chords is I say, okay, let's say it's an inversion. So that's a first inversion chord. Hopefully we all know that, but that's what it is, you know, okay? But the way I would express that in pop chords is I would say, well, it's a C major chord, right? I know this about it. But what's the lowest sounding note? E. E is the lowest sounding note. So what I say in this instance is I say C slash E, or you might say C over E. That's what you hear a lot of times, C over E. And so what it does is it, it Basically, it's quite literal. It's saying it's a C major chord, but E's the bottom note. Okay? What it's not saying, guys, this is what used to throw me off. I used to think this was like two chords at once. It's like it's a C major chord and an E major chord. I would have this like, you know, like, that doesn't, that would sound awful, which it would, right? But what it is, it's this C over E. So it's saying that the bottom note that you will find is E, but the chord itself is a C chord. Okay? So if I were to invert this again, I would have. Here's the same three notes, right, but again in a different order. What's the lowest sounding note now? G. 
So this would be C slash what? C slash G. Okay, and this works for any chord. Here's the part that you have to really be aware of. If let's say you wrote D major, okay, and you wanted to invert it one time, you'd say, okay, so that's F sharp, A, G, that's the position I find it in. A lot of times I see these responses come back on tests and on quizzes. Is that correct? What's wrong about it? It's not F sharp. Does that make sense? You can't call this D over F because what's the lowest note? F sharp, not F, right? So this is one thing I always, I always like, I'm a bit of a nag as regards to this, but when people are like, I, you know, spelling chords with key, I'm like, okay, so what's the key in, uh, in A flat major? They're like B, E, A, D. I'm like, is it? B flat, E flat, A flat, D flat. That's your key signature, not B, E, A, D. Right, you have to always be that tuned in, okay? And then it's like, what's a four chord? Well, D at no, is it? Is D flat. And if I start saying it's DFA, I just spell a D minor chord. I'm not even in the key anymore. Does this make sense? You have to be hyper vigilant about this stuff. It's easy to get lazy. If you're lazy, you're almost always going to be wrong. Okay? You have to make sure that you think about the key or the, the chord factors at all times. Okay? Any questions regarding this? Okay. Now, here's another thing that I want to talk about. This is the terminology. So far in this class, we've talked about scale degrees a lot. Okay, and we talked about these early on in the class. We said, okay, so you have scale degree one, you have scale degree two, you just do little parades on them, right? You know, when you write that, that's what that means. Okay. So if I said, hey, you're in the key of C, what's scale degree seven? Well, that would be C, right? And you just kind of go there. But when you start dealing with triads, it gets stickier, because now we have not just horizontal structures, but we have vertical structures too, right? We have to start to acknowledge different things that are happening, right? I can go this way or I can go this way. I'm not limited anymore, okay? And so what I have to, what I have to take stock of is if I start spelling chords, I'm not going to refer to this as scale degree anymore because is this part of a scale or is this part of a chord right now? It's part of a chord, right? So I have a different context for what I'm trying to evaluate. Everybody with me? Okay. So I'm trying to evaluate what these are. So I start to use this term chord factor. And this enables me to, to be concise about, or maybe not even concise, but explicit about what I'm talking about, okay? If I say, hey, you're in a D major chord, what's the, what's the fifth chord factor? Well, the fifth chord factor is D, F sharp, and A, that's five above the root. Does that make sense? I'm talking about the intervals within the chord as opposed to the steps within a key. It's different. Sorry, that's the fifth chord factor? Yes. Okay. Okay, so for instance, let's say, let's say that I'm in the key of C, okay? <coughs> now, that's a three chord, right? The danger is that I would look at this and I would start to confuse scale degrees and chord factors. And so if I ask you, hey, what's the fifth chord factor? You know that it's going to be B because the reference point is this chord not just the key itself. You follow me? This isn't, this isn't scale degree five, because what's scale degree five in the key of G? C, D, E, F, G. That's scale degree five, you understand me? So what you start to do is you start to evaluate the chord as its own little ecosystem within a bigger ecosystem. And that's what chord factor is useful for, for labels. Okay. I know it's a lot of words, I know it's a lot of terms, right? As you get more more used to using them, you've used them for longer, and you'll start to, yeah, it's just, you know, it is what it is. Does this make sense? All right. So, <coughs> big takeaways for today. You've got to remember the difference between your perfect intervals and your major minor interval, right? You cannot get those mixed up. Um, 
know how to deal with your half steps, right? What's diminished, what's minor. If it's a half step, but it's the same letter, remember that's gonna be some kind of unison if you have to, if you have to get in the weeds without analyzing it, okay? C to C sharp is in a minor second, even though functionally, you know, you wouldn't know. Um, but then the big thing about the chords is figured bass is its own little world. Top chords are their own little world. Now they're both very useful, right? What I tell people a lot of the time is, let's say I have a piece of music. Um, yeah, it's pretty standard, like you see this in organ music, for instance, the pedal line, here's the, the cue manual, right? So if I have, Technically, this looks like a lot of different things, right? Because I've got a note here, and then I've got an interval here, and then I've got a triad here, right? So that's like a lot of information. But if I take it all as a giant picture, what chord is this? It's just a C major chord, right? I've got a C here, I've got a C here, I've got E. I've got G's and I've got G's, right? So this is really just a big C major chord, okay? So where you start within this is you can look at the piece of music and say, well, it's in the key of C major because it doesn't have any sharps or flats, right? But if you look at this, is the first thought in your brain going to be this is a one chord? Probably not. It's going to be what are the what are the chord factors, right? I've got C, I've got E, I've got G. So when I, I know what a C major chord is, it's those three notes. So now I know that this is a one chord. But what you did first in your head is you actually kind of thought of the pop chord first, right? And then you went in and you assigned a number to it, right? So we do use both of these at once. Generally, the final answer in an in a academic setting is going to be some kind of numeral. Now, am I done here? Why not, Justin? Because the triple clef is a circle. Okay. Or You're no, on the right track. It's an uh, inversion. Right? Okay. So now here comes the final part of this, right? You're, you're seeing the right thing. Who gets the final say in what inversion this chord is? The very bottom note, right? And if I look at this, is that the very bottom note? Is that? This one is. And what is that? So this is a first inversion C chord, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write 1, 6 for my final answer. Does that make sense? And that's what I mean, guys. When you when you write a piece of music, if I look at this, this looks like a textbook example of a first inversion chord. Like if I ask you, hey, write a C chord first inversion, and you wrote that, that's about right. So that's kind of what I'd expect you to write. Not some crazy four part staff answer, that'd be stupid, right? That's not what we're doing here. But functionally in music, it's whoever's got the lowest note that, that wins the game, okay? So on your test, when you take these tests, I'm only gonna ask you questions in these real simple positions. Okay, I'm not gonna ask you to write them in multi-save, I don't wanna look at that, take too long, right? It doesn't really change anything because in this little tiny chord, what's the lowest sounding note? So this is an F major chord in root position. And it doesn't matter how many staves of this I have, if the lowest sounding note is F, a root position chord is a root position chord, okay? And so we're gonna only answer in these simple forms right now, but just realize your analysis almost always gets more complex than that. Okay, it's almost always gonna take more thought. So, that's an F major chord. Here's why figured bass is important. If I was in the key of F, what is this chord? One chord. If I was in the key of C, what is that chord? Okay. If I'm in the key of, oh, hang on. Is that a, I'm in the key of D minor. What is that chord? Uh, three. You see? So the information about this chord will change based on the key zone that I find myself in. Has the chord changed once? Okay. 
And so that's what we're working toward, is understanding if I'm in this key, how does this cord function? What is its job? Because that enables you to know two things. If you want to write music, it enables you to know how to write good music that makes sense, right? Or if you were wanting to play music, it enables you to predict outcomes much more accurately, right? I remember being a kid and playing this music and being like, you can just wander into the wrong chord really easily because you don't know what's coming next, right? And as you understand the relationship of chords to one another, you start to say, well, I'm playing this chord, so the next chord should be this. And now you may be wrong, you may guess wrong, you may play a wrong chord, but you are gonna be able to bounce back faster because you have a sense of what should have happened. And if they surprise you, you realize it was a surprise. As opposed to just like, everything's a surprise, which is how it used to when I was reading, you know, 10, 11, it's like, oh, look at that, what's that now? You know, like, hello, I'm good. Does this make sense? So we want to, we want to understand both of these equally, the top chord and the figured bass, but this is gonna teach us about chord interaction, and that's the important thing that happens. That's what we're working on. Okay, so what I'm going to do on Wednesday is I'm going to have a series of quizzes for you, okay? It's going to be burn your brain out day, all right? It's just gonna be quiz after quiz after quiz after quiz after quiz, all right? And I will take them up for grade, so don't skip. Ha! Um, just kidding, you guys are gonna be showing up. Um, but what I want to do is I want, they're gonna be relatively simple questions, okay? They're not gonna be hard questions, they're just gonna be high volume, because I want you to start to see, okay, like, I can, I can memorize this amount of information and then I can change it based on what I've memorized, okay? So it's gonna be a lot of simple interval questions, a lot of triad major minor questions, and then some of the more complex stuff for the end, okay? But it'll be all printed out and everything so you'll be able to just come in and take it, okay? But what I am gonna do, I'm gonna time every segment. I'm gonna do, okay, so the first segment is gonna be like five minutes, the next segment's gonna be like five minutes. That way you kinda get a sense of where do I feel comfortable and where do I feel uncomfortable with these? It's not to make you feel bad. It's to help you say, I had five minutes and I couldn't get my role of major seven done, but I got my role of perfect fifth done. So what do I need to study? Does that make sense? As opposed to just like, well, I have 35 minutes, I don't really know what I did in that amount of time. I want you to start to be able to identify your weaknesses and identify your strengths so you know where you should study tomorrow. Sound good? All right, got questions, stick around. If not, I will see you.